Well, thank you everyone for uh, being here on this last afternoon of the conference. Uh, it's been an amazing conference so far. It's my first time attending a Rails conference and speaking at one. I am. <laughs> thank you. I am quite stoked, excited, caffeinated, and sufficiently nervous. So, incidents happen. You know, unpredictable things happen with computers in production, and humans are paged to help resolve them. Some are quite stressful, while others are fairly all right. A small audience engagement activity. Um, how many of you have written code as part of your application that has behaved in an unpredictable way or resulted in an outage and caught you off guard? Great, almost all of us. That's great, because bad things happen in production all the time. And is anyone on call right now? OK. <laughs> Hopefully not. But if you are, and if you get page, it could be a fun conference activity to maybe live debug a page together. I'm only kidding. Um, all right, that's great to see. Uh, today, I'm not going to tell you how to write the most perfect Rails code or Postgres queries so your application never faces an incident. I don't claim myself to be an expert in either of these technologies. I, however, love Rails, and I love Postgres, and I also love outages. Of course, I don't love outages result in a potential customer impact or customer unhappiness or business impact. However, I think that's also what makes them so meaningful, because these production incidents provide you with a unique opportunity to improve your current state of systems and processes for good. And if you really want, there can be a lot to unpack about all the contributing factors that lead to an outage. Outages where you come out feeling like you learned something new about your system are usually my favorite ones because it feels so rewarding. And that's what the session is about today. Amongst other things, I'll be sharing a bit about a production incident where I came out feeling, you know, I'm glad it happened. Once in a while, you want an incident that forces you to think things from first principles. The incident helped identify some very interesting edge cases and prompted us to rethink parts of our system in a way that will scale much better using some interesting Postgres and Rails concepts. So let's go over a few things that we'll cover today. I'll be talking about some really interesting work all my talented teammates and I did at times. We'll start with discussing an incident where we lost all our dynamically scheduled customer jobs and how a very interesting edge case led to that scenario. I'll also discuss the lessons we learned and how we went back to first principles in designing a system that was more predictable and scalable using some interesting Postgres techniques. I'll also cover different kinds of locking mechanism in Postgres and what worked well for us, especially skip lock and some interesting ways we find it to be quite useful. Next, we'll talk a bit about advisory locking and how we can use that to synchronize concurrent application workloads without running into any lock contentions. If you were in the off to the races talk right before this one, some of this might feel a little similar. Lastly, we'll end the talk by talking a bit about timeouts, one of my favorite topics, and some useful patterns for auto-healing applications in production when a connection issue occurs in Active Record. My goal for today is to leave you with some really short, simple, and actionable takeaways about Rails and Postgres. While it's definitely possible that everything I shared today may or may not directly apply to you, but I hope that you still come across something new and informational today. I'm Cheyenne. I've been programming in Ruby and Ruby on Rails for about 10 years now. My very first experience with Rails was working on a Google Summer of Code project, for those of you who are familiar with that. And then there was no stopping me after. These are my social handles. If you would like to stay in touch, stay connected, find me on the interwebs. That's where you can reach me at. I live in Cambridge, and that's my dog, Ollie. I just need an excuse to insert his photo wherever I can. His name may or may not have been derived uh, by the shorthand form for observability. At the time, I was reading a lot about observability and thought it would be fun to get his name tag printed as 011Y, you know, 11 letters between 011Y. The pet shop thought it was a typo and autocorrected it to O-L-L-Y, and I think that's probably for the best. 
On to some more serious things, I work at Times on the platform engineering team. Times is a no-code automation platform for uh, security teams. We have customers from startups to Fortune 10 companies. Uh, we like to use Rails for all our business critical operations that our customers rely on. So let's dive right in. This is something that happened at the fall of last year when our support team got alerted by a curious customer of ours who were expecting a certain job of theirs to run on times at the hour mark, but didn't. Before diving in too deep and discussing uh, about the incident, I want to give you a quick context on how Tynes works. At a very high level, Tynes setup is not very different from your modern day Rails application. It has a front end with React, Relay, GraphQL, and on the back end, it's Ruby on Rails. It's primarily a monolith with different invocation points uh, for certain application workloads, like for a web service, a bunch of worker services, and some cron scheduler services. It is deployed on multiple containers that can be horizontally scaled out and vertically scaled up. For database, we use Postgres, and for caching, we use Redis. We also use Sidekick for processing all our async workloads. Something to note, Tynes is a multi-tenant application, and for enterprise customers, we also have the ability to spin up Tynes in a single clustered mode, which means each customer gets their own dedicated database, Redis, a VPC, subnet, the whole, the whole deal. So this is a screenshot of how one of the product screens looks like within Tynes. We call this a story. A story has the ability to have many actions with different characteristics. You can connect one action to another, and events generated from any previous action are passed down to the next action. You can perform and receive HTTP requests. You can massage the data in many different formats using a built-in formulas. You can talk to third-party APIs, send emails, and much more, all without having to write any code. And I promise that's the last time I'll talk about Tynes as a product today. Now, here's an example. The story is responsible for querying a list, list of Cisco security advisories, looping over them, deduping any advisories based on certain logic present inside the deduplicate events action, and then depending on the result, it will accordingly trigger an email to either the WebEx customers or the UCS director customers in this case. Very simple, right? Um, now, I need some way to invoke this story. Let's say I want the story to run every hour because my compliance team has told me that we need to respect our SLAs for any critical advisory discovered. So we need to make sure the emails are out in a timely fashion. This could go to Jira, GitHub, anywhere else on the internet. Uh, for now, we're just gonna send an email. And this is what the data stored in the database looked like at the time in the actions table. Along with other information related to actions table, we would also store the cron equivalent of when that action should run and how often, and if there was a preferred time zone. Now that you know how the data is stored, let's, take a, let's talk a little bit about how an action that needs to run on a certain time is scheduled. There are a lot of ways to schedule a job with Sidekick. We use a popular gem called Sidekick Scheduler. When scheduling jobs, there are two kinds of jobs. The first is static jobs. There are a finite set of Sidekick jobs uh, defined by a YAML file. These are primarily internal jobs that run on a schedule. Here's an example of running a job that keeps the gravitars fresh every hour, and every five minutes we send some data to our analytics store. Next are dynamic jobs. You tell Sidekick Scheduler that the system also wants to work with dynamic jobs by setting the dynamic attribute to true. By setting the dynamic attribute to true, Sidekick Scheduler spins up an internal thread that runs every five seconds to see if any new jobs have been scheduled. If so, it accordingly enqueues the job in Sidekick. Sidekick Scheduler uses Rufus Scheduler, another popular gem. For the purposes of this talk, I won't go into too much detail on how the internals of Rufus Scheduler works. So how do these dynamic jobs get scheduled? When a new dynamic job is added or updated by a customer from the UI, like we saw before, we append the same in Redis, just like we do in our primary database in Postgres as well. So it is available to be queued by Sidekick Scheduler. We use this helper function exposed in the Sidekick module by Sidekick Scheduler called set underscore schedule. Behind the scenes, it appends the job in a Redis set. The roofer scheduler that runs every five seconds checks the Redis set for newly scheduled jobs to be enqueued further. Now that you know how dynamic job is scheduled, uh, there's one interesting thing to know about this. 
Sidekick Scheduler clears the schedule for both static and dynamic jobs in Redis anytime a Sidekick worker shuts down. And when a Sidekick worker starts up, it accordingly reads the schedule and populates the set in Redis. Now in addition, we also have an internal job that ensures that all the dynamic jobs in Postgres are also in Redis when a Sidekick process starts up as a safety measure. The internal job does so by querying the actions table and populating the schedule in Redis through an internal class called scheduler. The internal job also is responsible for clearing the entire schedule first and then re-adding the static and dynamic jobs. This means during a deploy, in total, there are three parts of a system that are updating the schedule set. Let's recap them. First is when the sidekick server starts up, sorry, when the sidekick server shuts down. A prompt sidekick scheduler to clear the schedule from Redis. Second, when Sidekick server starts up, our internal job that is enqueued is resetting the schedule first, as seen here, and then repopulating the static and dynamic jobs both. And finally, the additional thread that is spun up by Sidekick scheduler, which runs every five seconds on each Sidekick process to reconcile the schedule and accordingly enqueue any scheduled jobs to make sure they're out on the right time. Even though these operations are meant to be idempotent, there can be a lot going on, especially during a deploy, especially here. Now, if you have worked with distributed systems like this before, your spidey senses might start to tingle already at this point. Anyone in the audience who has an inkling as to where I might be going with this? That's okay. We're about to find out. Now that you know more about the setup, here comes the fun part. So back to the day of the incident, around 12.56 p.m. on this day, a deployment had gone out. A deployment basically performs a rolling restart of all our containers and in batches. Around 12.59 p.m., old containers are shutting down and new containers are coming up. At 12.59 and 49 seconds, one of the new processes experienced a fatal exception and crashed. At one second past 1 p.m., a new container comes online and registers the schedule in Redis. During this time, any scheduled action run that was supposed to run on the hour mark, at 1 p.m., was missed. This was because for about 12 seconds after 12.59 and 49 seconds, there was no schedule registered in Redis, which means when a healthy container came up and scanned Redis to enqueue any potential new jobs, it skipped on the hourly job run because it was already one second past 1 p.m., which means any job that was supposed to run on 1 p.m. on the hourly schedule will now get, get to run at 2 p.m. on the next hourly schedule, even if it was off by a second. This happened for other jobs, too, that were supposed to run on the hour mark. Now, you might be wondering, what was the fatal exception? The fatal exception occurred in Sidekick Scheduler due to a race condition caused by our internal job. This update schedule is a block of code that is run by Sidekick Scheduler thread every five seconds, which basically reads the schedule, reconciles any differences, and then enqueues any static or dynamically jobs to Sidekick. Now remember how I mentioned the internal job resets the schedule when a Sidekick container starts up? Around this time, the reconciler thread pulled the list of jobs from Redis, tried updating the list with any potential new schedules. However, at the same time, a new container as part of the deployment that had just spun up kicked off the internal job to add back the dynamic jobs to Redis. And like I mentioned before, the internal job starts by clearing the list from Redis first. The timing of clearing the list in Redis from the internal job and the reconciler thread trying to update the schedule in Redis overlapped, and the reconciler thread crashed hard when it couldn't correctly reference the list of jobs in its in-memory hash. At this time, there were no active scheduler instances in the stack, and no scheduled jobs were queued at the hour mark. It crashed hard because this expression of sidekick.schedule, where it's looking up a value in the hash using the variable name schedule underscore name, it returned nil due to the lack of jobs registered in Redis. This is a very rough snapshot and a high-level overview of the events that occurred at 12.59 p.m. A process that is shutting down is clearing the list from Redis. Next, a new container coming up has enqueued the internal job. As I mentioned before, it does so by clearing the list from uh, clearing the existing state and repopulating the updated list from sc scheduled jobs again. All the meanwhile, the reconciler thread 
from any existing container is querying Redis to also read from the schedule and enqueue jobs. Had this happened at 12.20 p.m., we, we may not have noticed this, also especially since for systems like this, it's more common for customers to schedule an hourly job rather than to schedule a job at 18 minutes past 12 p.m. And that was the incident for today. It took us a few, de uh, few days to piece all these details together. For most part, the system has worked fine in the past as well. However, after we concluded the incident, I was glad we had it. As you could probably tell, a lot of things had to happen at a very specific time from different parts of the system for us to observe these conditions. And we came out learning a lot about the various contributing factors. We knew that this was not the most perfect scheduling system out there and had plans to make it better. But now we have even more urgency and enough reason to proceed. So where do we go from here? Back to first principles. We know the shortcomings of our current system and know that we would like to improve it significantly. So let's start out by building a small list of requirements from a new potential system. As a product offering, the lowest denomination we support are per minute action runs, which means you can schedule your job um, from, from the product like we saw before to run every minute or less frequently. So every hour, every six hours, every day, and so on. We'd also like to have less moving pieces that update a central piece of the system from unintended code paths. We have a lot of customers who run times in their own self-hosted uh, uh, self -hosted cloud or on-prem environments, which also happens to be a nice forcing function for when considering what new technology we would like to introduce to our stack so that it doesn't incur any operational pain on us or our customers in production. I'm also a big fan of boring technology. What I mean by that is introducing any new technology comes at a cost like engineering time, training and learning, operational cost, and so on. Boring technology forces you to think in simple and innovative ways on how you can reduce those costs by reusing existing technologies and patterns as much as possible. Lastly, we, know, we also know that it's okay for the action runs to be slightly delayed than being completely dropped. In other words, it's okay for the scheduled hourly job to run, let's say, 10 seconds late instead of missing the entirely hourly job mark altogether like we saw before. This is where our new scheduler system comes in. And the idea is we'll still continue to use SatGig scheduler for, for all our static jobs. It's doing a great job at it. In addition, we now use the new scheduler system for all the dynamically scheduled customer jobs. We decided to use Postgres as the primary source of truth for all schedules and their subsequent runs. Every minute, we run a sidekick job in queued by sidekick scheduler that acts as a fan out job. It queries the database for any action runs that are supposed to be executed at the current time window and accordingly queues those jobs to be processed by sidekick. We now have a new static job. Let's call this a new fan out job. It runs every minute and pulls all stored customer schedule jobs in the table that should be run now at the current minute, and then calls the instance function name run on the call run for each action schedule object. And this is what the function name run looks like. It has a safety check to skip run if the value for the next run at column for the action schedule instance is past the current time, because it'll just get picked up on the next run. Next, we calculate when the job should be run next and persist that on the action schedule row and then accordingly enqueue the job. That said, we do have something very interesting going on here. Here we are using something called optimistic concurrency control. This control is quite critical in ensuring th that this job is idempotent and also in ensuring that we don't accidentally end up scheduling the same job twice. Say for, uh, say for some reason there were two copies of the fan out job running at the same time. We also enqueue the job if we have been success successfully able to update the same row that we have been working with. If for some reason we haven't been able to fetch the same row to be able to update it, we'll skip the enqueue. Not being able to fetch the row with same conditions would usually be a sign that some other fan out job, perhaps accidentally, was already trying to enqueue this dynamically scheduled job. Now let's zoom out a little bit from this and understand how optimistic and pessimistic locking works with Postgres to better understand what's going on here. Optimistic and pessimistic locking mechanisms determine how the transactions in our application access the underlying data in the database. Optimistic locking means a specific record in the database table is open for all users and transactions. 
Optimistic locking does not lock any of the database records at the time of reading. It's at the time of updates, it determines whether the data it's updating has changed or not, and accordingly makes a decision of updating the row. If you think about it, it's not quite really a lock, hence referring to it loosely as the optimistic concurrency control. Optimistic concurrency control is generally useful when the application has a lot of reads and a few updates. Pessimistic locking is where our application will explicitly lock the records for the current transactions and, uh, and other transactions have to wait until the current transaction finishes. If not designed carefully, you can run into deadlock scenarios with this. So back to the new scheduler system, what you see here is our use of optimistic locking or optimistic concurrency control. In this example, we are querying the row by a few different attributes and then calling update all on the same row with a future date. It'll return the same row because we're also passing in the ID. If the select call then yield into any results, the update all will just be a no-op and we'll skip the NQ. And that is how we achieve optimistic concurrency control with this. In contrast, this is what it would look like if we were to opt for pessimistic locking in updating the row. This is a few downsides for us. There is a risk of running into lock contentions if the if in the form of row locks if the NQ is taking longer than expected. And the risk of NQing the same job twice if the same block of code were to get executed by two fan out jobs running around the same time and the second job is waiting for the lock to be released from the first job and then it would end up updating the row and enqueuing the job again. Hence, we decided to use optimistic concrete control as a way to achieve at most once delivery. With this new system, we can now be rest assured that even if the fan out job misses its minute one or is off by a few seconds, we won't miss the hourly job like before as the original fan out query, oops, as the original fan out query will return all the relevant rows from the database for further enqueue. We were able to come up with a prototype in just a matter of a few days, because as you can probably tell, there's not a whole lot of code being written here. We were able to roll out the new system to some internal stacks first. That system worked much better than our previous system. None of our monitoring caught any issues or any missed runs. And our, instrument, our instrumentation only gave us further confidence as we, as we had before and after data to compare. And after a week, we were able to roll this out to all our customers and haven't seen any issues since then. Okay, I think I might have earned some water at this point. Continuing on the theme of locks, let's explore skip lock in Postgres. It's one of my favorite Postgres features, and at this point, it's fairly an old one, I believe, because I think it's been out since 9.5. One of the main uses of skip lock is for building simple and reliable concurrent, concurrent work queue-like systems. Generally, when doing an update, update query, Postgres will lock each row it finds until the transaction is committed or rolled back. For most use cases, that is the desired behavior. It means concurrent updates will be persisted correctly or will throw deadlock error. However, if you only care about the first update or the last update and would like to cut through all the weight, you can skip them with skip locked. See what I did there? <laughs> now, if you remember at the beginning of the slide, Tynes actions deal with a lot of events. Any action that is performed generates an event that captures some relevant metadata about that event on the actions table. Now let's take a look at how some of that looks like in the actions table. As we saw before, actions table has its own native information, but also has columns like last event at and last error log at. We update these columns on an actions row after each event, and, if, and also if an event has reported an error in the workflow. Now, for regular workloads, it's not really an issue. But let's say if a Tyne story received a webhook and we are working with a large list of vulnerabilities, we can run into a lot of contention caused from row locks. That can happen because our system design is to enqueue a sidekick job for each of those action runs and aggregate the information concurrently. Depending on how large that fan out is, we could see, that we could see a lot of lock contention on the database because a bunch of sidekick workers are trying to update the same action row like performing agent.touch on the last event that column in the diagram. A handful of large fanouts would be enough to considerably slow down the processing of events, which is, far from ideal, which is far from ideal for us. This is how the database performance insights would look like in AWS, just pure red everywhere, uh, resulting from row locks. Now, there are a lot of ways to solve this problem. We could re-architect the table, split them into smaller tables even. 
However, this is also the kind of information where we don't really want atomicity, and the use of data is fairly for aesthetic reasons, and we're okay with the last right win solution. And this is where skip lock comes in. It is literally saying to Postgres, hey, by the way, if you're trying to update this row with a timestamp and see someone else is already working on it, feel free to skip it and move on. Skip lock is great for updates in a concurrent workload environments like this. So we introduced a new function called update columns with skip lock that can be called on any application record object to safely update a column without running into lock contention. This is what the function looks like. We take advantage of an already lock function on the application record class and pass it the for update skip lock clause to append at the end of the select statement. That would be incurred from the find by method. And then accordingly proceed to update the row if there was no other transaction already working on that specific row. Which means we can now use the new function on any instance of action or any other model for that matter. And at the bottom is what the generated SQL query would look like from the find by action. And just like that, we fixed the issue of lock contention and brought down our P99 from 1.5 seconds to 100 milliseconds. It also allowed us to process a higher number of events than before because we were, no, we were spending no time in lock queues anymore. These figures are from our Honeycomb installation after we performed some internal load testing uh, before and after rolling out the change. The second series of spike that you see is where we rolled out the change. A small change, but very impactful. All right, moving on to advisory locks. <laughs> it's really locks all the way down from here. Um, we're almost there. I appreciate you hanging out with me so far. We're gonna try and make sure it's not your typical slow and long running database transactions. Promise, sadly, that's my best attempt at a database joke. <laughs> Moving on, so uh, Postgres provides a means of creating locks that can be controlled via the application. These locks are called advisory locks and are an ideal candidate for concurrency control, where the standard MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, doesn't quite work out. So for things like row locks and table locks. When using advisory locks, Postgres expects the user to be in full control from the time of acquiring the lock to letting it go. Advisory locks are great for coordinating synchronized access to shared resource or third-party API so that multiple parts of the system aren't working on these shared resources at the same time. This is how you would acquire a lock and then release a lock. To acquire an advisory lock, you can pass any 64-bit number to the function. The 64-bit number acts as your unique key, and your application can acquire and release this lock whichever way it wants. Alternatively, instead of passing one 64-bit number to the function, you can pass two 32-bit numbers to the function as well. Now, instead of having to work directly with SQL, you can use Ruby. These are two of my really favorite gems and also I'm familiar with. You can use either of these, but for the purposes of this talk and examples, we'll use the first one with advisory lock. This is an example from the readme of, with advisory lock. This is basically acquiring a lock with a lock name. Internally, the gem is responsible for hashing the string for a lock name into two 32-bit integers as a lock key. The lock is released once the block returns. Optionally, you can pass it a timeout and lock will be released after that duration. Let's take a look at an example. If you recall from a few slides ago, we have a static schedule job called pool analytics event job. This job runs every five minutes uh, and when it runs, we want to make sure that we don't accidentally end up duplicating our analytics data by running the job twice, you know, until we find the time for making the job item patent. With advisory locking, uh, we can do something like this. Here we wrap the sidekick job in a block with advisory lock with a timeout of 30 seconds. If another sidekick job is enqueued and run, it'll check if the advisory lock is already enqueued. If it already is, then it won't perform anything inside the block and simply return. Now we can go back to our Jira board and make the job edit pretend again. Of course, it's worth considering the safer timeout limits based on how long the job takes and what level of job time and timeouts you're comfortable with. Now for the last chapter, I want to leave you with some really lightweight operational tips and best practices for Postgres in production. Starting with timeouts. I would just put timeouts in your queries uh, it's much better to have a single query timing out than one slow query occupying 100% of your database resources and affecting other parts of your system. If you use PG Bouncer or similar connection pooler, you can pass it from there, or you can set it inside your Postgres config as well. 
I like setting it from the database.yaml file as it applies to all the connections coming out of the application. And it's also quite easy. And as you can see, here we are setting a statement timeout for all queries, a timeout for how long a query should wait trying to acquire a lock before giving up and throwing an error, and lastly, an idle in transaction session timeout so that we don't have a lot of lingering idle transactions in the database. These figures are just an example. You can start here or perhaps even higher depending on your application and start working your way down or up. <laughs> Next are connection pools. Let's say your database failed over in production and also recovered on its own. Depending on how busy your application is, chances are that all the connections in your application connection pool are stale now as they are probably pinned to the previous writer instance before it failed over. They are, not, they are now failing with errors like unable to perform update in a read -only, on a read-only replica. To recover from it, usually you need a rolling restart of your application processes for it to successfully recover. While it's certainly fine, it would perhaps be nice for the application to auto-heal on its own and not having to require a manual intervention. At times, we are always looking for ways that, in which application can self-heal and be resilient to scenarios like this. We solve for this issue by monkey patching active record and doing something like this. This is not the entire patch, but just a part of it, and I'm intentionally being a bit hand wavy about the function names also. So where when an exception is raised that matches a common set of exception, which are raised by Postgres during a failover, we flush the local connection in the hopes of removing any stale ones. Next, if a query is not in transaction, we also attempt to reconnect and retry the query with a back off so that we are not stuck in an infinite retrial loop. We consider most queries to be safe for a retry, so that's why we do that, giving applications more chance to recover from intermittent failures and be more resilient in the cloud. And if a query was in transaction, we simply re-raise the error after clearing the connection so that when the same worker or thread or the process is about to make a new query, it can perform the query by creating and checking out a connection from the connection pool. And that is how we are able to achieve the self-heal or the auto-heal in production, because the connection pool will keep checking out new connections for any query until the database is back up, and new queries from that point will start working on its own without requiring any manual rolling restarts. If you'd like to check it out, we have open sources recently as a gem also. You can find it at github.com slash time slash adapter. The code looks a little different from what you saw, but it behaves similarly. That said, there's some really interesting work happening in this area, thanks to the Rails core team and Shopify, where Rails will soon have the ability to perform reconnect and retries on its own through some opt-in flags. So keep an eye out for this place in this area. And that is all I wanted to cover today. Uh, just to conclude, today we discussed uh, about a gnarly and hopefully an interesting incident. Um, looked at some simple uses of optimistic and, optimistic and pessimistic locking, uh, skip lock and advisory locks. We talked about some operational best practices like timeouts and reconnects. And if you have made it this far and I haven't bored you to sleep, thank you. I really appreciate you. And a special thanks to Noel, Serena, Connor, and my team, Team Carbon at Tynes, for their help with my feedback and CFP reviews. If you are curious why your platform team is called Team Carbon, feel free to find me after, I'd be happy to tell you. And finally, one last plug. Uh, if you have enjoyed learning about some of the things I've talked about today, we have, some ve uh, we have a few open roles at times. There's a lot more exciting things we are doing across product and engineering. So feel free to check out the careers page. I hope you found this talk useful. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with me, these are some of my handles. I'll be hanging out here in the room and outside if you have any questions for me. Thank you.